progress. I think the progress is the understanding and the willingness to cohabitate. We're all Saudis. We all have common denominators that we agree on. I mean, most Saudis, I think the vast majority are very patriotic, very proud of our country. We all agree on that. But who's to say who's the best Saudi? You know, like, you know, people want to live different strokes for different yeah, folks. Yeah. Hey, you. I'd like you to meet a good friend of mine. We met in a sports bar in Mallorca, Spain, a few years back. At that time, he was not looking like a Saudi and certainly didn't sound like one. As far as I remember, he was wearing a T-shirt and jeans. He had long hair and a well-groomed beard. In fact, he looked a little bit like Jesus, something he's been told many times. It was when the Champions League final was played, and I went there to see it and hang out with some other football fans. And by coincidence, he sat next to me. And then we became instant friends and started talking, forgetting everything about the match. And when it ended, we were still talking. The bar staff came over to us after midnight and said, we know that you're having a good time, but you have to leave. We're closing. That's when we looked around and realized that all the people in the packed bar had left and we were the only ones left. We kept in touch after that and when I came to Saudi Arabia, I reached out and he invited me over to his house. The man that greeted me was looking very different than the man I met in the sports bar. Now he was wearing a traditional white Saudi attire, an Arabic dress called a thobe or a twab. He welcomed me with a smile in the driveway of the house and inside we sat down in the living room for a cup of tea and a chat. I'd asked him if I could interview him for the podcast and he said yes. Also he said that I could ask him anything and he would give me his honest answers. Only thing was that he would like me not to say his real name and just call him Jay. After the interview I asked him why, if it could get him into trouble for being too honest and open. No, I wouldn't get in trouble, but I think so much of a message can be lost, misunderstood, heard a different way, considering the source. And in addition to I just don't like the limelight much, but more importantly than that, it doesn't really matter who I am. It's the message. It's getting the dialogue going. I have tried... To, I mean, I've blatantly said, okay, this is my opinion. But in other questions you've asked, I've tried to kind of distill, summarize the different views of, you know, I know a lot of different types of people and I've tried to represent the middle ground for kind of, I think, something most people, I'm sure I've said things some Saudis wouldn't agree with, but uh, you know, nobody agrees with everybody on everything. But what I've tried to do is represent the broad medium as best I could, and in a way that, you know, I think, I'm sure you have fans all over the world, but because of my my background, I uh, I understand how, how Americans think, and I understand how Saudis think, and I know the message that a lot of Saudis want to get out there, and I've seen it happen where sometimes it's just... A question of vocabulary, but more importantly, it's understanding how something would get received. And so that is why I, I asked to uh, not be mentioned by name, because I think it's the dialogue, it's the discussion, it's the message, which is important. And the source of that just isn't as important. As you'll hear, Jay is a storyteller and gives long answers <laughs> i come from a long line of storytellers so <laughs> i thought we would talk for about 30 minutes so a typical episode of the radio vagabond we wrapped it up an hour and a half later i thought about cutting it shorter but you'll get the entire conversation in two 45 minute episodes one today and one next thursday my name is Pala Bo, and this is the radio vagabond this is, this is the Radio, the Vagabond. Radio Vagabond Podcast. 
Hi, Jay. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So nice for you to invite me. And uh, I have a bunch of um, um, myths that I like you to confirm or bust for me. So right. it's kind of the Radio Vagabond Mythbusters version. Excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, Thank you very much for having me yeah. on your on your show. I'm a big yeah. fan. This episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. Whenever you need a hotel anywhere in the world, go to Hotels25.com. That would get you the best price. Hotels25.com searches a bunch of the biggest hotel sites in one simple search. Hotels25.com. You you speak very very decent English, <laughs> and that's because you're uh, yeah. you're you're totally bilingual. I I am, and uh, well, I try to hold off sometimes because it makes me look uh, much more intelligent than I actually am. But <laughs> the truth is, my my mother is American, and my father is Saudi. Uh, they were married in the early '80s, and my mother moved here. Uh, to Saudi before I was born, and I was raised here uh, until I was 18, yeah. and uh, then I went to university in in the states, which, uh, to be honest, wasn't really what I wanted to do because I was just out of high school. All my friends were here, yeah. and you know we used to go to the U.S. and we had a place, and I'd go every summer. But our house there was very remote, out in the woods. Where, where was it? Uh, it's in Idaho. Yeah. And uh, and so I was very close with my cousins for those summer months, my American mm-hmm. cousins. But uh, besides that, I mean, I, I you know there was a couple neighborhood kids, but I really didn't. I knew Americans here, and uh, you know, I so I wanted to stay. I was kind of toying with the idea because all my friends were here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think I had a very, uh, I was very lucky to have a, a very balanced life because, mm-hmm. uh, my parents both had a, a very strong mutual respect for each other as people, but also their cultures. So it was, you know, my mom who really pushed for us to do the traditional Saudi things and get out there and, mm. Uh, really promoted that and, you know, didn't give us much slack, you know, with that. Uh, because also my family is traditional. But you said that it was your mom that uh, had the European-American roots? Uh, yeah. So you would yes. think that she was the one going the other direction. Well, and that's usually how it is. But ah. uh, they they both recognized, uh, you know, that they made a decision to marry outside of their culture and very different cultures. And so not, neither of them ever put any pressure on each other or on uh, us kids to be one way or another. So while my mom really promoted our Saudi side, my dad was always very keen that we go every summer to the U.S., that uh, we play baseball. Uh, I'm a Boy Scout. I'm an American Boy Scout. I got Eagle Scout. <laughs> so I, I'm very fortunate uh, to have had a very balanced life between both cultures. Yeah. 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 So it was and my dad's insistence that I go to the States because yeah. that's what really changed his life. Yeah. And actually, just before I started recording, you told me that your mom is part Danish. She that, is part that, Danish. I did not know that yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, she is part uh, Danish and uh, Irish and uh, a little bit of Norwegian also. Oh, my God. So basically, you're a mud. I'm the mutt of the best kind, <laughs> and we live the longest, so I'm okay with that. Yeah. And it's uh, we met in uh, in a sports bar in Mallorca because there was a Champions League final. Uh, was that in '19 or something? That would have two and been, a half years ago. That would have been '19. Yeah. yeah, and I think I saw a little bit of the first half because we were just sitting next to each other and then started chatting and. Mm. I don't even remember having seen anything of the second no. half because we just we clicked. It's one of those uh, times where you really click with somebody and you just uh, kept talking. And the game stopped and the people left. And at the end, they had to kick us out because <laughs> we were the last it people was, there. Yeah, it was, it was one of the most such a bizarre experience. One of the most sincere conversations I think, uh, or substantial, I've had in a in a bar. That's that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be talking about love life, couples, arranged marriages, dating, sex before marriage, wedding traditions, dowry, the wedding party itself, and how different it is from our traditions. 
We also talk about the Saudi way of inviting guests over for dinner and not sitting down eating with them. About progress and the extreme changes in this young country, about Saudi Arabia opening up to tourism, and if the Saudis see the Western people as decadent and potentially a bad influence. But also about LGBTQ, if women are oppressed, about driving, drugs, drinking, democracy, crime and safety, the royal family, and camels. We have a lot to cover in these two episodes, so sit back and enjoy my interesting and very honest conversation with my Saudi friend, Jay. The rumor is that the royal family here has uh, around 20,000 members. Hmm. Are you are you a part of the royal family? I'm not, no. I'm not part of the royal family, nor are we married into it. Not, there's no uh, shared blood between yeah. myself and the royal family. Yeah. Do you know any? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know if they're 20,000, but there's a lot. You, you get to know a few. Um, but yeah, I, I do. And uh, the title, uh, Prince, was extended during different eras of the, the Saudi monarchy, different kings' eras. And it was extended to broader family. So mm-hmm. when I you know, mentioned my tribe versus my family, my family's a part of a larger tribe. Mm-hmm. You know, some point in history, probably someone would use the tribe as their family name. You know, so in a way, I guess that's one way you can look at it. But I think for a lot of people, when you say royals, because you have highness and then royal highness, and there's there's a hierarchy yeah. there. So the misconception is that everyone is from you know King Abdulaziz, the founder, and then his family tree from there. Mm-hmm it's important to distinguish between you know highness and royal highness uh, because here if someone mentions or it's in the paper you're getting usually to the third name especially because a lot of the names are repeated Sarud, Abdelaziz, Faisal so you have to know up to the grandfather to know exactly who you're talking about yeah. besides the, the prefix of yeah. royal highness versus yeah. highness yeah. coming up later in this episode How long is the dating period, and how does it work? Is there intimacy? Uh, Typically, I would say intimacy. I would say that's that's the minority. Physical intimacy. The ultimate destination for armchair travelers who are looking for inspiration to get out into the real world, let loose their wanderlust. The Radio Vagabond. Gotta keep moving. And now... Let's get back to the show. Let's talk a little bit about camels. Okay. That's a different oh, sure. topic. Yeah. <laughs> different topic. Yeah. You, you, uh, this country has the world's largest uh, camel hospital. Today I just visited the, the world's largest camel festival uh, where there's also a beauty pageant. I heard a rumor that uh, more than 40 camels got disqualified last year because they uh, had uh, plastic surgery or Botox. You would be surprised, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, truth be told, I, I uh, haven't spent... A lot of time around camels, but you no, know that you was know. that was actually my question. How many camels do you have? Ah, uh, well, zero. Thankfully, <laughs> they're very expensive to keep. But actually, it's quite an interesting culture. A very good, uh, well, used to be a very good friend and acquaintance of mine. He uh, raises camels for a living. I mean, he dropped out of school in uh, I think the seventh grade or eighth grade. So he could drive a truck and save enough money to buy a few head of camel and go into business with his father and uncle, who are quite famous for raising camels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was my first really up close and personal. I mean, he's a a proper nomad. Uh, He lives in the desert. He lives in a tent, which is another misconception. So not a digital nomad. Not a digital nomad. No, (laughs) not by by any stretch. But he's one of the few that still live life that way because... He needs to be on the move with his camels. And and uh, we were camping, and, you know, I've always thought it was just kind of people clinging to the past. But I'll tell you, when I went with him one time, and he invited us to his place out there, like his kind of base camp. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're out all day and running around. And at night, he plays an instrument called the uh, rubaba, which is like a kind of single string. You play it sort of like a violin with a bow. Mm-hmm. Uh don't hold it like that but it's a very old and traditional instrument 
And he started playing at night, and, uh, you know, I jumped out of my skin because the next thing I knew, his favorite camel stuck her head into the tent, and she was nuzzling him up against his head. I mean, it was the most affectionate, sweetest things I think I've seen. And, you know, this giant animal that, you know, it's not like I'm used to. It's not like a dog or no. something like, you know, that you you don't associate them being that affectionate and the mutual affection between I, them. I, I saw something similar a few hours ago I, I when I was at the camel market or at the camel festival. There, there was a guy who had a dancing camel. Mm. And then after um, it gave him a, a, a big hug and a kiss. Yeah. And it was really like almost like a dog. No, they're incredible animals. Uh, my... Uh, my great uncle, who I showed you his picture, uh, he raised camels. Yeah. And, you know, in those days, especially, uh, you know, we're talking early 1900s, yeah. uh, there wasn't a lot of resources. So you had to go where, where there was food for the camels to eat, where it was in bloom. And mm -hmm. so they moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were in a territory, I would say, about 200 kilometers away from where he lived. And a very bad dust storm came up. And, uh, as they do. As they do, yeah. They're a lot of fun, if you haven't been in one. Uh, <laughs> but they, he couldn't find his favorite one, and they were afraid. They had to make a move, otherwise they were going to lose the whole herd. So they had to leave her behind. And uh, two weeks later, she navigated her way about 200 kilometers back to where where you know where his house was where his home was i heard about that they kind of have a, a built-in gps yeah they yeah. do and especially if they're very keen you know to get back uh, they're as i said i don't know that much personally about camels but from what i've seen and uh an experience secondhand from people who do raise them uh well i know i guess three things about them one they're very expensive to keep you have to really love these animals you know to mm -hmm. to keep them and keep them well and keep them healthy yeah two they're very affectionate with you know uh, the people that are hands-on with raising them mm -hmm. and they're very intelligent in their own way you know that kind of uh, raw instinct you know that they have it's it's impressive and i've seen some glimpses of that in the limited time that i've spent mm -hmm. around camels yeah Enough camels. All right. Yeah, now, I'm glad we got that one out of the way. That's what everyone always asks. We got the camel out of the way. Now... We address the camel in the room. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about um, love life and, and couples. Is it love marriage or arranged marriage? Well, uh... I mean, it really depends on who you ask, and it depends on what decade you're asking in. So, if you talk about the 60s and 70s, I mean, it wasn't free love or anything like that, summer of love, you know, hippies, but it was a lot more relaxed, I think, and due to the nature of the social makeup, it was a lot more common for people to see you know, people that weren't direct relatives of theirs from the opposite sex, you know, whether it's in the market or it's, you know, your neighbor or, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot more strict in that sense. Uh, it was a bigger taboo. Uh, but again, it depends on who you ask. I mean, and what people are public about and what they're not public about. So did it happen? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean... If you say dating, you know, maybe not in, you know, like the, the Western sense, like we're going to go out. Now, tell me a little bit how dating works. How, uh, how do two people find each other? Well, same way as anywhere, I suppose. Like, you know, it could happen in public. You see someone that uh, you're interested in uh, and maybe make a move or go say hi or something. Uh, it could... And, yeah. and, and uh, I, when you say go and say hi, I take it that's mostly the guys that do that? I used to be. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I think, <clears throat> you know, the, the thing about Saudi that, that is very important for people to understand is, you know, I'm 35 years old. We Our generations are a lot shorter because historically people got married at a much younger age. Yeah. So... Compared to the West, where from one generation to the next, you have 
between 20 and 35 years mm -hmm. for a long time here it was you have between 15 and 20 years you know but from generation to generation so that makes for very kind of rapid progressions of culture because every generation has their own kind of culture and so it's Instead of being more linear, it's a lot more kind of jagged, you know, escalation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, I mean, some people, they're, they're okay with, you know, uh, if it's a family friend or maybe cousin, distant relative, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, they know each other. They're around each other socially. My family, for example, was very traditional. So by the time I was... 12 or 13, I don't think I ever saw any more of my female cousins, you know, that were the same age or older. Um, and some people are much more open about that kind of thing. When you talk about even arranged marriage, there are some arranged marriages. I mean, it's not as typical anymore, but, you know, when you talk 20 years ago, you know, and, and maybe in some areas of, of Saudi uh, is it you, more a rules thing than a city thing? It's, uh, you could say that, but some of them, you know, live in the city and they're very much still about that, where you see her on the wedding night. Mm -hmm. I think now what's typical is, you know, if you've heard or someone, you know, sometimes I think a common way is maybe your sister or your mother sees someone that would be appropriate for you and, you know, she's nice looking and good match and like you know talk it over with you and if you're willing then you go with you know your mom typically mm -hmm. to meet their family or with your dad mm -hmm. and ask to be engaged and then there's like an engagement period and people vary on what their limits are on that so some people yeah, say let's, let's go back to that uh, sure. in a bit uh, but i when when you say that uh, if you like the look but you, you can't really see them well uh, initially not, not always just, well then this is the the religion you're yeah. you have to see at least once before you get married so oh. it's actually incorrect to see them the night of the, the when it you know you should see them once you have that's your religious right to see her once before you get married mm -hmm. but again those kind of i don't know if you want to call it, it's not really a shotgun wedding but well i would say it's not very common at least not common in the in the spheres i'm aware of you know that's a very antiquated way of doing it yeah. i mean i know i have friends that dated for a couple of years you know and then got married and traveled together even how much of that they're open about i mean even when they do that it's only because i found out but even people i know that are very open-minded don't talk about it when they're doing that it's just a personal thing and mm -hmm. how much the families are involved again it varies very much i think but the sense of yeah, arranged marriage like mm -hmm. you know from the time you're born almost like east indian that that isn't very common at all and then there's there's degrees of the conservatism and uh you know to be honest i think well, in my opinion, it's progress because obviously the the man has a lot more choice in what family he wants to get married into, and the pendulum has swung more towards the middle. And I won't say it's even Stephen, no. but I think it's moved tremendously mm -hmm. in a in a in my opinion progressive yeah. way. But many people would disagree yeah. with me. So say if you, you you found someone that you think might be a match, how long is the dating period and how does it work? Is there intimacy? Uh, typically, I would say intimacy, I would say that's, that's the minority, physical intimacy. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, uh, that, you know, a lot of it is maybe talking on the phone or chaperoned visits or something. But I think a crucial thing here to understand is arranged marriage. It kind of <clears throat> gets a bad rap, but if they're going the traditional route, if it's not someone... I mean, these days you hear about people because we have a lot of people studying abroad, and so they meet in college and mm -hmm. kind of date, and it's much more much more resembles a, a Western type of relationship. Mm -hmm. But when you're saying uh, arranged, from both sides, you know, uh, I think... Well, I don't want to generalize, but I would say there's a, there's a fair amount of people that view marriage as 
uh, a social kind of contract between you and a mate, and you're trying to find a mate, mm-hmm. someone who maybe is from the same socioeconomic level as you, someone maybe who is from a similar cultural background as you, yeah. someone who has the same financial ambitions, uh, same idea about you know religion and how how much of a role religion will play in the household. So a lot of it is logistics. You know, the emotional love, I think, you know, eventually if you have the logistics down, it comes with time. It comes mm-hmm. with familiarity, with, um, you know, a shared history that you build together. So I, I think for a lot of people that that emotional or physical intimacy isn't as high on the priority list as other logistic, you know, issues. And when you look at some statistics, you know, in the States... Over half, or the majority of reasons cited for divorce, it's not lack of love, it's not, it's uh, disagreement over financial issues, Mm. you know. So I think when you say arranged, it's not necessarily arranged between the parents and the kids go along with it. Sometimes it's the children asking the parents to arrange that, you know, well, these are what I'm looking for in a mate, these are the... Oh, I like uh, taller women, or I like shorter women, or I like you know this, I like that. Uh, and aside, you know, from looks, that's that's an example. But you know, uh, I want someone who comes from a big family, for example, who's very family oriented. I want uh, these kind of things. I think whether it's and it it's usually initiated by mm-hmm. typically the man, but you kind of put out the. Mm, the I almost said demographics. But that's going to make me sound like a robot. <laughs> but the the qualities that you're looking for, yeah. and you say, okay, I'm looking, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the parents. Could be your your uncle. Could be your sister. You know, vice versa. You know, the girl typically, you know, once a girl has been identified, and they'll go and kind of have their first meeting together. And uh, again, religiously, if the girl says no, then that's it. That's so that's another big, you know, thing I, I think a lot of people, like when you ask, it's not as cut and dry because we have a very diverse culture, you know, for a country a little over the size of Texas, you know, north to south to east to west. It's to middle. literally as big as Texas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the, the culture is so diverse and a lot of people, you know, when they see conservative and yeah, a lot of times socially conservative people are also quite religious. Mm-hmm. But there is a differentiation between the two, yeah. you know. Um, so a lot of it is, is culture with regards to marriage. But yeah, with, with regards, you know, so if he comes and meets the girl and she doesn't want him, then mm-hmm. say no. And then, you know, hopefully if they have a good relationship, well, why? What are you looking for? What? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Again, what you do publicly and what, you know, especially uh, on the women's side of things, their designs for getting something to happen, you know, to spark romance or matchmake or something. Uh, most of that, you know, typically happens with uh, the women, the mothers, sisters, mm-hmm. aunts, that yeah. kind of thing. They kind of are the ones orchestrating and masterminding the, the whole thing. Tell me a little bit about the the weddings. What is a typical Saudi wedding? Typical Saudi wedding, uh, well, typically there's two. So there's the actual legal wedding where, uh, you know, it's it's uh, very uh, limited. It's just like the closest, closest family. And this is, this is in a mosque? Or? No, not necessarily. Okay. There is there is a, a cleric, uh, there's a sheikh that's there, but okay. it's not in a mosque. Uh, actually, I've never been to one in the mosque, except in the U.S., but that's where we could find a sheikh at the time. So, uh, But typically, uh, you know, you as the groom, so you've gotten you know, officially engaged, you've discussed logistics, where you're going to live, that kind of, it's all kind of been arranged. You go with, you know, your parents and uh, you know, your siblings and your closest, you know, even sometimes your closest friends don't come, but sometimes... You know, your closest friends and family. So a very, very small group. Uh, it's in the same house or same, sometimes wedding hall, sometimes. 
typically it's in a house and uh, and the men are on one side and the women are on one side and the women are kind of uh, uh, partying and having a good time and you know everyone dresses up and uh, and then uh, so you, it's, it's in the same room uh, different or rooms, different so rooms men are on one side and the women are on another side and uh, and then there will come a time where you you and your wife to be you sit down with the uh, player with the chef who is typically specializes in weddings and, and so he has a big book legal book signs you up you sign in there he asks you both do you have any kind of prenuptial agreements do you have any last minute requests something that's a prenup it's a binding prenup you know uh, religiously or legally mm-hmm. You know, last chance here. Anything else you want to say, mm-hmm. and uh, and then you sign your name, and you, you want to run, run. Now. Yeah, <laughs> or if you want to, you want to get one last thing in. You know, do it now, and uh, you sign, and uh, and he'll ask you know kind of some questions. Was the dowry paid, and how much was the dowry? Uh, Tell me about the dowry. So I didn't know that in most cultures, or like even usually you see it in historical dramas or something, that the dowry is paid to the man's family. But here the dowry is paid to the woman's family by the groom. Uh, so the dowry, uh, yeah, it's it's paid to her family. Typically, uh, sometimes it will be like as a wedding gift, you'll give, used to be like a chest of jewelry or something, gold, typically. The idea being, you know, you're talking about a place where in the past... The mortality rate for men was a lot higher and a lot younger. So, the idea being, this is kind of her insurance, a way to kind of carry on, you know, sell the jewelry if needed. Uh, but yeah, the dowry is paid to the wife's family, and there's no set amount. I mean, you know, there's kind of is it a negotiation? How much is typically? No, some people like sometimes the father of the bride will say the dowry is this much. There's no negotiating that typically, but I think it's more symbolic than anything. Uh, I mean, I know there's kind of the, I'd say a cultural norm, so to speak, for the time. But I know people who whose dowry was uh, one real, one real, and a good man's word. And that was it. That was his dowry, and that's what is on his marriage license. So yeah, you do that, and then uh, you sign, you're done, you get a little license that you take into the courthouse to officiate it. Uh, but you're now, stomachly and legally, you are married now. And then the uh, the groom will go in the back where the, the women are, and they'll kind of cheer you on as a couple, and that's the first time you're in public as a couple, a married couple. And you sit, and I've seen a couple, and it's pretty awkward. Like, looks like pretty awkward for the groom. But yeah, and uh, you know, you so sit. It goes into the room with only the women. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and they sit for a while and celebrate, and, you know, drink juice or something. And the first time as a couple, and then you know, go on each side. They have a feast, and from then on, you're married. But typically, after that, then you know, and sometimes this is when now they are free to do more of. Well, you were asking about dating intimacy because now they're legally married. Yeah. They haven't maybe made it public, you know, to everyone except for very close friends and family. But now they're free to go and come as they please, go out to dinner together, you know, travel together. Do that's it. Technically, she's your wife. You know, whether or not you live together yet or anything, you are now technically married. And so that's when a lot of you know more traditional people. That's when they explore kind of. And then, after some period, typically they'll do a, a met, like a wedding party, and that's where you're going public, and you're sending out invitations, and you're announcing to the new couple and everything. And and again, those are segregated, typically in Saudi. Yeah. So again, it's one room women, one room men, and you don't see it like a party where they're dancing and the men and women are dancing with each other and no uh, not not with each other i mean uh, uh, i mean even in you know more liberal or more open i'll say and i don't like the term liberal or just conservative but i'll say more open cultures there's some segregation i mean it's it's obviously different in egypt it's different in lebanon it's different 
but in the Gulf, for the most part, is segregated. Yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, again, depends on what region you're from. I mean, in a Western province, they're, you know, they you know, put music and stuff. And uh, the North as well, they have, you know, traditional dances. They'll do debka, they'll do... Mm-hmm. Uh, no, just as uh, a little bit more low-key for yeah. the guys. Side. But for somebody like you, who you, you spend a lot of time in the, in, in the West, do you find that weird? I know that I know that you're mostly Saudi, but uh, so <coughs> so take it in the best way. Oh yeah, because uh, uh, it's just so different yeah. uh, from uh, what where I come from. Yeah, well, I, I think um, well, I guess it's just my personal perspective on it. I think weddings here because the kind of got out of hand to the point it will prohibit some men from getting married because they just can't afford to do it yeah they're big they're big they're expensive i wouldn't say it's weird it's just different the same way i don't see uh, american weddings as weird i'm I'm used to both of them so i think it's just i you know as you can see i'm wearing my saudi attire but it, it's funny yeah, with that with an apple watch <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well it's it yeah it, again because i i think i, I transition so easily and yeah. seamlessly between both so nothing I, i could see how it would be weird to someone who who didn't see that but i think just because i've been around it my whole life i i don't no i don't really find it weird because i understand what again when you talk about symbolism and you talk about Okay, how did this tradition even start? Because in the end, that's all they are, is traditions. And so when you understand the history of the tradition and, and how things start this way, you kind of see the uh, the historical and social relevance to it. You know, And so, because that's quite clear to me, like I like taking you know my, my uh, expat friends to these kind of things because it's always refreshing or interesting to see it through their eyes because you get used to something and then someone will ask you a question and they say, oh, well, that because of this. But then you'll think, well, actually, I don't know. Sometimes you'll think, I don't know why that is. And so it's always interesting to see my country through foreigners' eyes. You know, it always is interesting. And, and, and also, yeah, many of the traditions that uh, I've grown up with and, and just been so used to, If you come from outer space and look at that, say, well, that's a strange thing to do. But yeah, well, and and I learn things every day because yeah. you know, if uh, uh, for example, uh, some tribes, and this has nothing to do with marriage, but it's just things you pick up. Some families, it's customary for the host not to eat with his guests. Like he'll let you in, and you go in, and you eat his food, and he doesn't eat with the guests. And I've always thought it was I. I knew like people who do it, but yeah. I never really stopped to wonder why. Well, then you find out. I, I like to read a lot, but I also like asking questions. I like hearing old stories. Well, that's because you know, in older times when uh, when food wasn't as readily available. I mean, people would come starving to these things, a chance to eat meat, you know, and, and fresh food. And so it's so none of your guests feel embarrassed by the host to see if you're eating a lot or if so. That's one of the reasons some people do it. But, you know, so with marriage traditions, it's, uh, you know, again, every tradition has its roots and every tradition kind of evolves into a modern application which, you know, a lot of people don't even know why we do that anymore. Wow. But I like to ask why. I like yeah, find exactly. Out. Yeah, if I in- invite people over for dinner, it's because I like their company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would I would find it really strange to just, here's the food, see ya. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and most, again, most people would. But it, when you look at it with, with a certain historical context, because, yeah. you know, I mean, Saudi is a very young country, which people forget. You know that it's been a, a, its own sovereign nation for relatively, I mean, compared to Europe or the U.S., a small amount of time. And in that time, you know, uh, well, let me put it to you like this: my grandmother couldn't read or write. You know, she was illiterate. My aunts, her daughters, are all literate and had various degrees of schooling. My cousins, their daughters, you're talking PhDs, you're talking very accomplished career women, you're talking 
So that's in the span of a very short amount of time. I mean, we're talking 50 years or less that this type of evolution from one generation to the next is leaps and bounds. So it's important to keep, I think, that you know, historical relevance in, in mind. And yeah, totally. And uh, I met a guy that I had a nice chat with, and he had a T-shirt on the back of it. It says, change in progress. <laughs> and I, I just had to take a photo because it, it, it's yeah. a country that is going through enormous changes. Yeah, I think that type of change, like not everyone's def- definition of when we say progress is is the same. But what I see and what I've seen over the past 15 years, let's say, when I got a little bit older and I started to look through different contexts, and by that point, excuse me, I'm just going to adjust my clothes here. I had a few guests to come visit me, stay with me for a summer, and as I was mentioning, I got to kind of view it through their eyes. And I think what you've seen, especially over the past 15 years or so, is less polarization. I think for a long time there, you were either way on one side of the spectrum or way on the other. Uh, and, you know, that 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 polarization, I think, generates uh, a lot of friction, uh, sometimes hostility. Uh, there's a lack of understanding, a lack of mutual, mm-hmm. maybe I wouldn't say respect, but mutual understanding, let's say. And I think what you see over this past 15 years is a lot of people moving towards the middle so i may not agree or that you know your decision may not be appropriate for me but live and let live as long as you're not encroaching on my ability to live the way i want to live mm-hmm. so I, I think there's a lot more acceptance towards that and whatever side of the spectrum you you find yourself on i would i would say unanimously that is progress mm-hmm. but for example, uh, whether it's women driving or abaya or, I mean, even music in public places was, you know, in, in the time I grew up when I was an adolescent, you would never go to a restaurant and hear, you know, piano music or, you know, anything like that. I was, it just wasn't, it wasn't done. And now, yeah, there's places that do it and places that don't. And if you go somewhere with music playing on speakers or live and and you're against that well you, there's plenty of other places to go eat and vice versa but i think cultural you know kind of wisdom tells us it's a lot like a pendulum and it's always swinging but yeah. you know so i think having new blood in in our leadership mm-hmm. that uh have a higher appetite for for risk you know which Again, you know, people 10 years younger than me, I mean, 25-year-olds, I just, I feel like they're from a different world. You know, the world they grew up in and are growing up in oh, is... Oh, the youngsters. <laughs> yeah, not, not by years. We don't look that different. But, you know, just the, culturally, we're so far apart, you know, what, uh, what, what I grew up with and what they grew up with. So yeah. progress, I think the progress is the understanding and the willingness to cohabitate we're all saudis we all have common denominators that we agree on i mean most saudis i think the vast majority are very patriotic very proud of our country we all agree on that but who's to say who uh who's the best saudi you know like you know people want to live different strokes for different folks if travel is your passion and you want escapism while still upholding your work and family responsibilities, you can travel vicariously from the comfort of your own home. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Do some Saudis uh, see the West as decadent and, uh, oh, oh no, we're going to open the borders to these uh, and, and all these bad values is coming into our country? <laughs> Well, historically, like, when I grew up, it was during the first Gulf War, you know, in the mid-90s. And so by then, people had gotten very kind of used to Americans specifically. So Americans is a little bit different than the rest of the West because then also you have the uh, Saudi American oil company for a long time. And so people since the 70s were were quite used to Americans, I think, more than other Westerners. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, that's so actually a short answer for once. I'll give you an answer right directly for your, your question. I would say no. I would say even, you know, historically going back, you know, uh, even when it was the most socially conservative time in the late 80s and in the 90s, I think... Uh, they're especially if they're from another religion, they're not really held to the standards that we would judge someone from our own culture by. Like, oh, that's that's their way, you know. That's that's okay. That's how they are, you know. I think more than anything, mm-hmm. and I found this to be true even with very like people with very limited external exposure or international exposure. More than anything, I think they're interested. They're interested. They want to ask questions like, oh, yeah. oh, have you ever been on a date? Have you ever, you know, done this? It's it's more intrigue. And, you know, I tell that to my friends here who haven't traveled or people who ask me, you know, what's it like being a Saudi Muslim in in America? And I say, you know, especially in the smaller towns, people are just interested. People that have a completely different background than I do from very rural towns, mm-hmm. not very diverse communities, you know, uh, not used to outsiders. More than anything, you know, they sometimes they can say something just because they don't know or out of ignorance, but ignorance isn't, uh, isn't a national thing. Everyone has ignorant people, but mm-hmm. you can be ignorant and and want to not be and ask a question and be interested and then you're not ignorant about that anymore. So I, I think that no, more than more than anything with, with Western culture, that's their culture, this is mine. Yeah. Now I think maybe people worry about because again, up until recently, uh, mass media, the the channels for that, you know, before obviously the internet age and now streaming and the age of streaming and uh, I think people are a little bit more concerned about cultural indoctrination or certain hot button issues that they worry about. But as far as values, I wouldn't say most people are ready to adopt Western cultural values. But it's not a m- morality thing. It's a it's a cultural thing. Not like you know they're doomed and we're you know, uh, you know, sent from heaven or something. I, I don't think people look at it like that. But, you know, again, the evolution of culture, and we were speaking about this before we started, it, it takes time, you know, to happen organically. And so when you see something on TV and you're trying to apply that in your community without having any of the uh, prerequisites, basically, that you go through, I mean... Like the states in in the '60s, yeah. you know, you couldn't uh, you couldn't have a biracial relationship, black man or white woman, or vice versa. It was you know to the point of threats of violence. I'm not talking you know 300 years ago. I'm talking you know very recently, you know, relatively. And obviously, the, the evolution of each culture is different because both cultures are different. But you can't just look at how it is today. You have to look at you know, it's a very slow migration and then women's liberation in the 70s and, you know, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I think I think the young people, which is two-thirds of our population, want to emulate that without having the, the context that it really fits into. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, people probably said that about my, my generation when they were their age, but we just weren't as exposed, you know, as they are now to all of this input. I think more than anything, they're interested. I mean, any time I bring a guest and I take them, you know, some of my friends live in the more rural areas. They don't speak English. And I'm just, I'm translating the whole time. It's like I'm not even there. I'm just a... A vehicle for them to talk to this guy like uh you know whether they're from i've had friends from holland i've had friends from the u.s obviously mm-hmm. had friends from uh from central america and they're yeah i i think most people are just very interested i mean there's obviously some slices of the the society that just want to be left alone don't want anything to do with it and you know, I think you find that in every society. So those those people are, are there, but I would say they're in the vast minority. Yeah. People that would have a moral judgment on, on that. Yeah. 
next week on the Radio Vagabond. Let's talk a little bit about LGBTQ. Mm. That is uh, not legal in the country? I mean, I don't know Does it that... exist? Uh, it exists, yeah. This is where we continue in part two of my conversation with my Saudi friend Jay. It will be in your podcast feed exactly a week from now. So make sure that you click that follow button on your podcast app. Are you okay with this? Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm great. Yeah. It's taken longer than I thought, but I'm that's... very long-winded. <laughs> I come from a long line of storytellers. So. <laughs> Thanks for having me in your ears. If you think someone else should hear this episode, please share it. My name is Palabo, and I gotta keep moving. See ya. Radio Produced by RadioGuru.co.uk